Once again, thank you all for being here this morning at Hope Community Church. We always deeply appreciate and value your presence with us. There's a lot of other things you could have done with your Sunday morning, but you chose to be here, and we do appreciate that. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. We had a nice one at our house. Uh, we have a little tradition the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, Holly and I, we take our two girls out to Lynn Villa, and we do the uh, cut your own tree down thing, the Christmas tree. Has anybody ever done that at Lynn Villa? Nobody? It's fun. It's fun. I mean, you go out, they take you on a hayride, you go out, you pick out your tree, you cut it down, and then they do most of the grunt work. I mean, they pick it up, they wrap it, they put it on your car, so it's not exactly the authentic experience, but it's fun, I guess. Um, Holly and I, we try to do these things for our kids. You know, we want to give them these experiences. Parents, you know what that's like, right? You try to create these experiences for your kids. We don't spend a lot of money on toys and stuff like that, but we try to do these experiences. And so we take them out, we get on the hayride, we get dropped off, and then we have to walk the little ways to get to the trees. And our oldest, Lily, starts complaining, oh, we have to walk so far. And Eve's getting restless and wants to get down. And we get to the place, and I'm like, okay, remember this? I said, we're going to have a system. We're going to walk down this aisle and back this way and down this way. We're just going to do this systematically until we find our tree. How long did that work, right? Not long at all. One of them's taken off this way. The other one's taken off this way. Holly's trying to wrangle the kids while I'm trying to find the perfect tree. And it took us forever to find a tree because somebody was being very, very picky about which tree we got. And so as we're doing this, the kids are fluctuating between enjoying themselves and running around and tripping over stumps and crying and complaining, why is this taking so long? No, I want this tree. No, I want this tree. Okay. So all this complaining is happening. We finally cut down the tree. We get the guy, puts it on the truck, we get in our car, we get it home, the end. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what an ordeal this whole thing was. I mean, here we are trying to create this, having some family fun, creating this experience. And it's just complaints, complaints, and crying and crying and fighting. And oh my goodness gracious. Parenting, man. Whew. It's challenging, isn't it? Parenting is challenging. Of course, the next morning, both the girls wake up, and they're reminiscing about yesterday and what we did, and they're reenacting the hayride on the couch, and they're talking about how much fun it was. Parenting, it's challenging, but it's rewarding, isn't it? Today's message slash sermon slash homily slash whatever you want to call it is about parenting, okay? Okay. And so if you are a parent, this message is for you. If you've got little kids or big kids or adult kids, this message is for you. If one day you might be a parent, then this message is for you. And if you're somebody who has parents, this message is for you. So hopefully, hopefully you'll find something applicable to you in this message. Now listen, here's the deal. Our oldest isn't five years old yet. So I've only been a parent for less than five years, all right? So most of what I know about parenting, admittedly, is theoretical knowledge. I only have less than five years of practical experience, but I do know, I have figured out this one thing, I do know that parenting is challenging. There are these little kind of silly challenges like wrangling the kids when you're cutting down a tree, and then there are much, much, much bigger challenges that parents are faced with, especially as their children age and become teenagers and become adults and all the dynamics that shift and change throughout time. Parenting is challenging. Now, those of us who are uh, Christians, if you want to call us that, or church people or you know, followers of Jesus Christ, wow, that's a heavy term, um, we have a very specific challenge in this world. Throughout the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, one of the big concepts that you find in Scripture is this idea that there is such a thing as righteousness, or more literally put, a right way, a right path, sometimes described as the way of the Lord. And what the Bible does is it kind of separates out this idea of there's a way of the Lord and there's a way of the world. There's a, there's a path that the Lord wants us to follow. There's things that He wants us to do, things that He wants us to pursue. And then there's like a way or a trend of culture, a way of the world, and, and the things that the world will want us to, to do. And there's a current of culture that pulls us in the opposite direction. And so one of the challenges of being a parent and being a Christian is, is attempting to train up our children in this way of the Lord, in this righteous way. And it is challenging because, like I said, it, it's countercultural to do this. Now, the world, I mean, specifically the culture that we live in, we're taught to value certain things. We're encouraged to pursue certain things. There are certain things that we're encouraged to do and other things we're encouraged not to do. I mean, you know, in America, we're, we're encouraged, and this is not just America, but in lots of places around the world, where we encourage um, our children and, and people are encouraged to pursue education, which is a wonderful thing, Right? And education is great. We're supposed to pursue education, and, and you're supposed to really dive into your different talents and your hobbies and your, and your art and your dance and your, and your sports or whatever it is. Whatever you're thinking as a kid, you're really encouraged to, to excel in that, and that's wonderful, and that's fantastic. We're also encouraged in this culture to you know, pursue, if not wealth, to pursue financial security. Again, what's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. But we're taught to pursue all these things in our culture. 
But then Jesus tells us, okay, that's fine, but there's something else we need to pursue first. There's something else we should be seeking after first. In the book of Matthew, which is the first book in your New Testament, it's a gospel, it's a biography of the life of Jesus Christ. And in that book, there's a time, uh, it's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus is teaching the people. He's giving his first big sermon. And in Matthew 6, Jesus talks about all these different things that people can seek after, that people are pursuing in the world. And he tells people, so you got to seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And everything else... All other things will be added unto you. All these other things God will take care of. Read Matthew chapter 6 for yourself. It's really short. But Jesus is communicating this idea. There are these things that as human beings, and it really doesn't have to do with like maybe a cultural influence, but just as humans, there are things we want to make sure we take care of, like finding clothes right to eat and making sure we have uh, clothes to eat. Can I just say that? That's awesome. Do we have a gag reel going? Put that on that. Boop, boop, boop. Finding clothes to eat, some delicious clothes. Finding food to eat, finding clothes to wear, finding shelter. I mean, basic needs. Why wouldn't we be chasing after these things? And Jesus says, your heavenly Father knows you need them. Seek him first. Pursue building a relationship with him first. Seek him first. And trust me, he'll take care of the rest. That's what Jesus tells us. That's a tough message. That's a counter-cultural message. That's a counterintuitive message. But Jesus tells us and encourages us, if you're going to be my follower, seek first God and his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and God will take care of the rest. So parents, that's one of your challenges. If you're going to try to raise your kids or train them up in the way of the Lord, is to teach them to pursue certain things. Certain things need to be in the right order. You need to have priorities here. Now, when our kids are little, we set their schedules. As parents, it may not feel like that when they're infants and they're crying and they have to eat and all that. But really, overall, when kids are young, we set their schedules. We decide where they're going to be and how long they're going to be there and when they go home. And when. We set their schedules, which is an incredible thing. Because when you have control over somebody else's schedule, you have control over their priorities. Did you realize that? When you control someone's schedule, you control their priorities. Because where you spend time, that reflects where your priorities are. And so if you spend all your time as a parent, you know, doing whatever the thing is, you know, okay, school is the thing and studying is the thing and you got to prepare for the science fair and you got to do your work and you got to be educated. If that's where you spend most of your time as a parent, directing your kids in that direction, having them work on that, then they're going to pick up from you that that's the biggest priority. Now, again, education is a fantastic priority. It's very important. But is it number one? Well, Jesus would say, no, 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 no. God needs to be the first priority. And so when our kids are young, we have control over their schedules. If we have control over their schedules, we set their priorities. Does that make sense? We set their priorities when they're young. So we do that. And the older we get, the older they get, we lose some of that control, don't we? We lose control over their schedules and we lose control over their priorities. And so hopefully while they're young, we'll have enough influence with them that they'll want to pursue the right things when they grow up. But here's the thing, parents, and if you have adult children or if you have teenage children and they're going to be, you know, if you have young children, they're going to be adult children one day, okay? Here's the thing, parents, even when our kids aren't kids anymore, even when our children are adults, we may not have control, but we still have influence in their lives. The words from a mother or a father to an adult child still carry a lot of weight. And so there is this wonderful burden, if I could put it that way, that we parents have of encouraging our children in the right way and training them up in the way of the Lord. We had a little scripture passage that Holly read for us today, just a couple of verses. But uh, if you spend any time in, in Sunday school or CCD or church or had anything like that in your background, you may be somewhat familiar with this story. This is an occasion where Jesus is there teaching a crowd. And we don't have all the details, but we get the idea that he's teaching a group of people and there are some children that come up to him, and probably the parents are like, oh, go see Jesus, go see him, right? And so the children come up to him, and he's, you know, he's blessing the children, and the disciples, they're like, well, we got to stop this, we got to shut this down, and so they try to shoo the kids away. I don't know if they get a broom out, get out of here, kids, I don't know. They try to shoo the kids away from Jesus, and Jesus says, no, 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 let them come here. Let the children come to me. You know that? Have you heard that one before, right? We even have these, like, paintings of this scene of Jesus and the children. Have you seen some of these? You know, and the children are all, like, very clean and well-behaved and sitting politely on Jesus' knee. You know what I mean? That's what we see. And so we read this story, and some of us Christians, we can be very, very critical of the disciples. Like, what are you guys thinking? Why are you trying to shoo the kids away from Jesus? Let them come to Jesus. And see, I think we're a little too critical of those disciples sometimes. 
Because the disciples didn't see what was happening. You know, the disciples were thinking about other things. You know, Jesus, he's got other places to go. I mean, this is the Son of God. He's got an agenda. He's got a schedule. He's got people to heal, things to teach. This is God here, okay? The kids are great, and he loves the kids, but we got we to gotta move on. So they weren't thinking about what was happening here. They weren't realizing what they were doing. And Jesus corrects them. Jesus rebukes them. They weren't realizing that they were depriving these kids of an opportunity to literally build a relationship with the Son of the living God and to be blessed by Him and to learn from Him. They didn't see it that way. And I don't think, I don't think we should be so critical of them. Now, as our kids age and as they grow up and as they go through life, they develop certain interests, they develop hobbies, they develop skills, they develop, you know, different you know, talents in their life, and, and they're going to come across many, many people who want to have a positive influence in their lives. There's going to be coaches, there's going to be music teachers, there's going to be play directors, there's going to be Boy Scout leaders, Girl Scout leaders, there's going to be all these wonderful people who want to have a positive impact on the life of our children. They, they're going to be there. They're going to, hopefully, they'll be there in Jacob's life, people who care about him and want to nurture him and give something to him. But here's what ends up happening sometime, sometimes. Some of these wonderful, well-meaning people end up trying to take our kids away from Jesus away from opportunities to learn about him, away from those opportunities to develop their relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't see it that way. They don't see it that way. They don't think they're doing anything wrong. But inadvertently, well-meaning, wonderful, wonderful people are inadvertently taking our kids away from those opportunities to build a relationship with Jesus, to learn about him to develop their relationship with him, and to actually put into action what he has said and taught us to do, to be the church. Now, I told you, what, a parent for five years? What do I know about this stuff? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, you guys who have teenagers, your parents who have teenagers, you know what it's like when your kid comes home with the schedule, and it's like, okay, we got this sports practice, we got this, you know, play rehearsal, we got this band practice, we got this, well, we got to go to the scouts, we got, you know, I don't know what it's like to get the schedules back in the backpack. You guys know what that's like, some of you who have teenagers? You feel like, oh my goodness, so many people want our kids to do this and that. And it's all good things. But some of those good things aren't the best thing. Some of those good things aren't the great thing. And if we let some of those good things take our kids away from learning about Jesus, ooh, there can be consequences to that. And so all those wonderful people, the directors, the, the coaches, the music teachers, all those people who maybe schedule things on a Sunday morning or schedule things during you know, youth group time or whatever it is, or your family, Bible reading time if you have that, they don't think of themselves as robbing kids of an opportunity to learn about Jesus. They don't think that way. And they shouldn't think that way. That's not their job. Parents, that's your job. That's your job to be mindful of your kids and where their priorities are and where they're spending their time, isn't it? I mean, isn't that our job, parents? Parents, I want to give you a break. I want to cut you some slack, and I want to remind you of something. You have the power. You have the authority to say no sometimes. When your kids are being pulled in all different directions and all these different wonderful opportunities they're given, sometimes you need to say no. You can't chase after all these things. We need to pursue one thing first and foremost and let the rest take care of itself. Now, again, I don't have much practical experience with dealing with this. I mean, all that Holly and I have had to deal with was one time one of Lily's little friends had a birthday party on a Sunday morning. I think it was going to start at 1130, which is when we're done here. It was about 35 minutes away. And so Holly said to the mom, hey, is it all right if we're a little late? Because church is just something we do in the mornings, all right? And it worked out fine. But we had a decision to make in that moment. I mean, what's the big deal if Lily misses one day in children's church? I mean, what's the big deal? It's probably not that big of a deal, right? But here's the thing. We need to communicate a message to Lily about what's important. We do. And I've, I feel that burden. I need to communicate to my children a message about what's important in life. And I feel like if I let them, you know, as soon as something else comes up, we skip church, what is that communicating to my kids about our priorities as a family, or about what their priorities should be? And so it all worked out fine. Again, what do I know? <laughs> when they get to be 10 years, all this stuff's going to be a lot more difficult than I know it. But we as parents, we can say no. Now, I do know one family in particular at our last church, Bethlehem Church, and all the children were raised. And, and Holly and I are pretty intentional about doing this. We seek after parents who are further down the road than we are. 
And we say, hey, you guys have done some things right. What are you doing right? How does this work? And so this one family of Bethlehem Church, the parents, the mom, and the dad, they were very, very determined to set these priorities, godly priorities for their kids. We go to church Sunday mornings. You go to youth group Sunday night. You go to Bible study Wednesday or whenever it was. They set those priorities. And it meant that those parents had to say no to some things. And it wasn't always easy. It wasn't always easy. But let me give you, like, I feel like I'm about to tell you a secret about God, okay? It's not a secret, but it feels like a secret. When you do, listen to this, okay? If you were tuning out up to this point, tune in now, all right? When you do what God tells you to do, God honors that. When you seek after what God has commanded you to seek after, God will honor that. And so these parents that we know, this family that they know, it wasn't easy for them to make God a priority in the lives of their children, but they did so. And it meant that the kids were upset sometimes about things that they couldn't do. It meant that they had a, you know, I remember hearing a story <laughs> about a very upset band director. Why can't your kid do this trip? But the parents had to say, no. It was challenging, but you know what? They raised four kids. Those kids are all adults. Those kids all know Jesus as their Savior and of all married Christian spouses. Christian parents, isn't that what you want for your kids? I mean, you want them to do well in school, that's great, but don't you want them to be saved more than that? Don't you want them to know Jesus more than that? That's the wonderful burden we have of parent, as parents, setting priorities for our kids, putting them on the path to righteousness, training them up in the way of the Lord. John and Rosemary, I'm going to have a private conversation with you in front of everybody. <laughs> what you guys are doing today is awesome. Do you realize what they're doing? They're making this commitment. They're dedicating Jacob to the Lord. They're making this commitment in front of all of us that they are going to prioritize Jacob's relationship with the Lord. And that's tough for us parents. We need to model that in our own lives and help our kids understand that that's what they should pursue also, building that relationship with the Lord. Parents, it's challenging, isn't it, to be a parent? But when we do what God has commanded us to do, he will honor that and he will help us. I'd like to, to close this sermon with a prayer for all the parents in the room and all the future parents, okay? This is for you. I understand your burden a little bit. I appreciate what you're going through. I appreciate the challenges, but I know with God's help, you can succeed. Let's pray. Father God, bless the parents here today. Lord Jesus, we know that, that you love children, that you love spending time with children, that you want to develop a relationship with the children that are here as part of this church. But Father God, you need to help us parents. It's so difficult. There's so many things coming at us. There are so many opportunities that we have to, to plug our kids into different things and different activities and different pursuits. And we just pray, Lord, that you would help us as parents. Help us reflect a godly lifestyle to our children. Help us set godly priorities for our kids. And Father God, we're trusting that when we intentionally do this, that you will honor that and that you will help us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.